Let's put our hands together. My world was shaken, my heart was broken, my hope was fading, my hope closing in. But now I'm singing, look how it lifted me. The flood is coming. Oh, hallelujah. Look how he lived in me. Oh, look how he lifted me. His grace and mercy is my testimony for every victory. I got a song to sing. But it's 
This is the glory of God. I love this song because it really is the glory of God to take something that is dead and bring it to life. It really is the glory of God to take a life that is broken and sin and addiction and, and junk and faithlessness and somehow give grace to that life. That's what the glory of God does. That's just the nature of who God is. He rose Yeshua from the dead, and he took us who were dead in our sins by complete grace and, and somehow brought them to life in the Messiah. And he's going to take Israel, who is dead, and bring life to it in that ultimate purpose of his plan isn't that awesome? That is the glory of God, to take something that is dead and bring it to life. We thank you, Lord, for your life today. We thank you for the resurrection power in the Spirit of God. We thank you and we bless you for that. Can we just sing that again? Oh. All of this for your glory, Lord, oh.
this is for your glory. Everything, Lord, the glory of God in earthen vessels, in broken vessels, so that the glory would be of God and not of us. You use us, Lord, so that it can be shown that it's not us. It's completely of you. Get the glory out of our life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We're going to get ready to bless the kids right now as they come forward and make their way to the front. Could you just extend your hands toward them? God loves them so much. Father, we thank you for our children as they come. Lord, we pray, God, the love of God would just be made manifest in their life. Lord, it would be seen in their life. Lord, they would become more and more in love with you as they encounter you. They become more and more in love with you as they learn about you and see you, God. Bless our teachers. Bless everyone that's going to be down there and Miss Jaylene that's helping with the kids. Bless them, God. Give them a word from God for these kids. And all of these we dedicate to your glory. Each one of these children we give and dedicate to the glory of God in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Bye, kids. Amen. Amen. Isn't it great to have a congregation full of kids? <laughs> it's an awesome thing. I, I love the next generation. I love my generation, but it's good to have the generation coming up too, or else we'll all die and leave nothing to to the world. So praise God. And we're going to take up God's tithes and our offerings today. If they can get ready to pass those baskets around. We are almost to the goal uh, on the subject of our giving. We are almost at the goal of raising um, a uh, money for our van that we're using to transport people back and forth to the congregation. We really thank you. And from the heart of God, thank you for your generosity and your gifts and your continued faithfulness and giving. And we pray, as Paul prayed, that every gift that you give would be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. In, in fact, let's just pray that over our offerings and over you. Lord, everyone that has given finances, Lord, everyone that has been faithful to God's house and to God's people and to give, Lord, I pray that you would bless them right now. Lord, that you would give back to them. You would be generous to them even more than they're able to be generous to you. Lord, that same generosity of heart isn't derived from us. It's derived from the Father. So if we are generous, it's because you are generous, Lord. So I pray that in your generosity, it would overflow into their lives, into their finances, into their families, into their hearts, into their extended families. And I pray that you bless King of Kings community, Herzliya, as we continue to give even 10% of our income back into the body of Messiah here in Israel and to congregations, Lord. I pray that you would bless us as well, Lord. Let a spirit of generosity reign over this camp. Lord, let it be overflowing out of our hearts because we know that it reflects the heart of the Father. We bless you and we thank you for your generosity as we continue our worship today in Yeshua's name. Amen. Now, Lee. 
verse again. for you today, exalting you, lifting you up, Lord, bringing you glory. Hallelujah. Be exalted this morning in our worship.
fall afresh on us this morning. Oh, we are lovers of your presence. We are lovers of your presence. We are lovers of your presence. Fall afresh, fall afresh on us. I'm a lover of your presence. A lover of your presence. Lovers of your presence, fall afresh on us. Like the song says, because there's no meaning without your presence. I can't live without your presence. I can't breathe without your presence. There's no meaning. Lord, I pray this this morning. Your presence would just be downloaded into each and every person in this room, each and every person hearing this, each and every person connected to this, whether it's in the streaming, whether it's outside. Lord, fall afresh on us with your presence. Bring something, Lord, that only you can satisfy that only you can touch Lord only you can do Lord only you can touch our hearts in a way as we exalt you and surrender and give you glory God let your presence come down and just fill every one of us we want to be filled. We want to be filled with your presence, God. We love your presence, Lord. you are God that you're pouring down on us this morning Lord we receive your presence your goodness and we thank you Lord we thank you Father for your joy for your freedom that comes when we surrender our praises unto you when we turn our eyes unto you we thank you, God, for the freedom, for the peace that comes with that. Lord, we receive that. We receive that today, and I pray that anyone that maybe hasn't experienced your presence, or maybe they feel like they don't deserve it, or they don't understand it, Lord, you touch their hearts this morning. You touch them in a very tangible way that only only be, that is only between you and them feel Lord fill them fill them with your presence and your touch from heaven and Lord we exalt you today and we thank you God we thank you for what you're doing this morning we ask that you are that you will make our ears ready to ear hear our minds, that our minds would be alert, our hearts would be receptive to hear what you want to speak to us this morning, to receive from your word this morning. Let us be receptive, God. Let us be attentive to what you want to say to us, God. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Can we give him a hand clap of praise? How many of you love his presence? Amen. Hallelujah. We don't want to live without it. Can you join us as we sing the Shema? Shema Israel Adonai Elohim. Oh, 
Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Can you all hear me? Shabbat Shalom. Okay. okay. <laughs> it's good to be back home. Praise God. You shall be reading this morning the Torah. I will shall be reading from the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 18 from verse 1 to 10 and 2 Kings, 1 Kings rather, chapter 1 from verse 30 to 40 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15 from verse 50 to 57. So we start with uh, the book of Genesis chapter 18 I read from verse 1 and the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mara and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day and he lifted up his eyes and looked and lo three men stood by him and when he saw them he ran to meet them from the tenth door and bowed himself towards the ground. Verse 3 and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee for the servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be first and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Verse 5, and I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. After that, you shall pass on. For therefore are ye come to your servant. And he said, So do. And thou hast said. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal knead it and make cakes upon the heath and Abraham ran unto the head and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto a young man and he hasted to dress it verse 8 and he took butter and milk and the calf and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them and he stood by them under the tree and they did it. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah, thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. Verse 10. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. Praise the Lord. So we move on to the book of First Kings, chapter 1. First Kings, chapter 1, from verse 30. Are we up there? And I read. Even as I swear unto thee by the Lord God of Israel, saying, Assuredly, Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne in my stead. Even so will I certainly do this day. Then Bathsheba bowed with her face to the earth and did reverence to the king and said, Let my Lord David live forever. Verse 32. And King David said, Call me Zadok the priest, and Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehudiah. And they came before the king. The king also said unto them, Take with you the servants of your Lord, and cause Solomon my son to ride upon my own mule, and bring him down to Gihon. Verse 34. And, and let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet 
anoint him there king over Israel and blow ye with the trumpet and say God save King Solomon then ye shall come upon come up after him that he may come and sit upon my throne for he shall be king in my stead and I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Judah 36 and Benaiah the son of Jehoda answered the king and said amen the Lord God of my Lord the king say so too and the Lord hath been with my Lord the king even so he be with Solomon and make his throne greater than the throne of my Lord King David 38 so Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet and Benaiah the son of Jehoda and Charitatite and the Pelitites went down and caused Solomon to ride upon King David's mule and brought him to Gihon and Zadok the priest took an horn of oil out of the tabernacle and anointed Solomon and they, and they blew the trumpet and all the people said God save King Solomon verse 40 and all the people came up after him the people piped with pipes and rejoiced with great joy so the earth rent with the sound of them praise you the Lord so my wife shall be reading the second part of the Torah yeah, the, as believers in Yeshua, we shall be reading from the book of Cor Corinthians. From the book of First Corinthians, chapter 15, 50 to 57. I read. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God neither do corruption inherit incorruption behold i show you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in a in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruptible, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy stink? O grave, where is thy victory? The stink of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And stay here for a moment. We want to honor Francisca and Young. And uh, let me just put this right here. Perfect. This is a little bit out of the way. You are flying back to Nigeria tonight, today, tonight. And we just want to take some time and honor Young and Francisca. Uh, they've been really instru instrumental uh, for, with us, for us as a congregation. Uh, you've been with us for the last three years. And uh, there, there are a few families, few couples where, where Chilina and I would just say, I don't know how we would have done it without you. And you're one of the couples. And uh, family, actually Kobe is uh, downstairs with the kids. And we said our goodbyes to uh, TJ a few weeks ago, uh, who started study, his studies in Canada. So just from Chilina and myself, but also from us, uh, I would even go so far, I don't know where we were without you guys. Um, your faithfulness, 
uh, your prayers, your generosity. Uh, thank you so much uh, for just being with us and yeah, pushing us through. And we just appreciate that so much. And I want to ask Hannah and Kwame if you if you would just come up with me uh, and Matthew and Daniela. Uh, we have a T-shirt, two T-shirts for you. I believe you actually have them. Is that correct? Yes, you have the blue one too. So I'll, I'll see if I can. And anyway, uh, it says connected as family uh, from Her Herzliya, King of Kings Herzliya. So this is, uh, we're going to say our goodbyes, our farewell, uh, but we will stay connected with you. And um, yeah, this is our hope and uh, the joy uh, that we uh, get to live in. Uh, it's a sad moment to say goodbye to you, but we're also grateful and happy and, and glad that we're able to send you out, send you to Nigeria as also ambassadors uh, for this nation, uh, for this congregation and for its people. So thank you so much. Uh, let's take uh, a few moments. Kwame, would you pray with us? Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this time, Lord. Our hearts are filled with gratitude and thanksgiving unto you, for you are the most high God. Thank you for the life of our brother Young, our sister Francisca, for their children, Kobe and TJ, Lord. We thank you for their stay here in Israel, Lord. We thank you for all the things you've taken them through in this land, for all the things that they have learned here in this land, for all the people they have come into contact with in this land, for all the fellowships, Lord, that they have built, Lord, in this place, Lord. We want to commit them into your hands as they go back to their home in Nigeria, Lord. We pray that you help them settle quickly. We pray, Lord, for um, a quick adjustment, Lord, to life back home, Lord. We pray that you would guide them in all that they do. And we pray, Lord, that they would continue to walk in your will and in your way, O oh God. We pray for angelic assistance. We pray for angelic guidance. We pray for angelic protection wherever they may go, Lord. And even in the years be, be beyond, Lord. We pray for their children, Lord, Kobe and TJ, Lord, that they will grow up in the fear and the knowledge of the Lord, Lord, that they would walk in your ways, O oh God, and that their hearts will continually seek and search after you, O oh God. We thank you, Lord, for all the things they have done for this congregation. We just want to pray that you bless them and multiply them abundantly, Lord, according to your word. In Yeshua's name we pray with thanksgiving, Lord. Amen. Lord, and we, we have a, a sad eye and a, and a happy eye. And Lord, we, we're just very grateful for the time that we had with Francisca and Young and the whole family. And Lord, we're, we're happy also to send them out, send them from here uh, back to Nigeria. Lord, we, we, we bless their travels. Lord, we, we, we ask you to give them favor on their trip. Pray that you would help them to settle in quickly. And Lord, we, we bless uh, the congregation, the church that they're uh, starting to attend. And uh, we're happy for them uh, because we, we have seen uh, the fruit of their their labor, and we're just uh, happy that other people will be able to benefit from it. Other congregations will be benefiting from it. So we bless them, and thank you that you keep us connected as a family. In Yeshua's name, amen. We also have another little gift for you. Uh, because you are strong in prayer, uh, we thought, and you may have that as well, but maybe special from us, uh, a prayer shawl, a talit. Uh, from us for you as a family and yeah uh, again thank you so much uh, for all that you have done uh, for us and with us and we bless you and we will not forget you God bless you yes give them a hand I before we go uh, and welcome a very special person or family. I want to mention a few things. Um, bef some of you or many of you actually are in our WhatsApp group. Many of you get our email. 
Uh, if you don't, uh, there's this little card here. You can fill it out, put your name in, your email address. If you want, your phone number, and we add you to our email and WhatsApp list. Uh, this way, you're always up to date. And the WhatsApp is just helpful because sometimes things change quickly, and uh, it's a good way to notify you. And then we do this uh, chronologically. Next week is one of my favorite Saturdays of the month. And when I say this, most of you people understand already what's happening. Uh, we have our monthly potluck community lunch coming up. That means, if you don't know, if you've never participated, that means everybody brings a meal. Usually the, the rule is families bring a meal, singles can bring a side dish, congregation covers the drinks. You can also bring a dessert if you'd like, but the main dishes and the side dishes most important. Uh, and it's a beautiful time uh, to spend a little bit more time together. Uh, it's great to taste different kind of foods, and I love the time. I love that Shabbat together. So the way this works is we have our service, and then we'll just do some changes here outside, put some tables up, and start eating. So everything will happen right here, right after the service. Then on December 3rd, there is a flyer out there, and very exciting. It's going to be our first holiday market. Hanukkah slash Christmas market right here. Uh, we are working on getting some vendors in uh, to sell Hanukkah Christmas uh, stuff. Could be decor, could be anything. Uh, I don't know. Uh, so mark your calendar. Uh, December 3rd from, I don't even know, 10, 11, 10 to 3, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, music holiday gifts and vendors, festive drinks, cookies, and Mexican food, and more. I mean, these, th through, these four points are already good, but there's even more. And then the following week, so this is Friday, and then on Saturday, Saturday, December 11th at 6 p.m., we have our famous Let There Be Light uh, caroling. So that is a very, that's always a highlight of the year. Uh, where we come together. It's usually outside, right here, and uh, beautifully decorated, and we, we sing uh, songs together uh, for an hour, approximately, and uh, I don't want you to miss this, so put this on your calendar. And there's also flyers if you want to invite friends or neighbors or co-workers. Take that flyer with you and mark your calendar December 11th, 6 p.m. And that is it for now. Now I really want to welcome Michael Mistretta. And you're here, you can come up. Uh, you, you're here with your, uh, your family and excited to have you with us. And just a short little introduction. Michael, you're the CEO of FIRM, which is the Fellowship of Israel Related Ministries. You can share all about it later, but what you actually do is uh, you, you bless the congregations and ministries here in the land uh, with uh, basically your whole team is trying to, to bless us uh, with resources, even financially. And uh, Matthew just mentioned it a few minutes ago. Uh, we've been fundraising for a van and firm actually collected through different donors uh, $15,000 uh, toward that. So thank you so much. Uh, we're working hard on uh, covering our part. Uh, we are two-thirds there to, to cover our $20,000. And again, thank you so much and thank you. And you guys are just wonderful people. Uh, you're Canadian, your wife is American, but you're also Israeli. You made Aliyah five years, four years ago? Seven years ago already. Awesome. Wow. Time flies. Anyway, so uh, the question, so we've been in a series, you asked for it. and. Yes, somebody asked for it. Uh, in this case, it's me. I get to ask a question too. Uh, why is Israel special? Or why should we care about Israel? So that's a little bit of the question for you. And very excited to have you with us and very excited to hear from you. Thank you so much. Well, it's an honor to be here. I'm, I'm now wondering why I wasn't invited next week for the potluck. Uh, 
I come the week that there's no food. But I love the I love the holiday I love the holiday market. I mean, how amazing that you don't have to go to you don't have to go to Germany. You can come right here in Herzliya and have this amazing market. There we go. If you see me here next Saturday, you know why. Um, it's a real honor and privilege to be here. We love uh, uh, Pastor Daniel and Jaylene, and they're just very dear people to us. I'm here with my wife Vanessa. I don't know if you can see her. She's right over there. Uh, beautiful bride, and our son is taking a nap right now downstairs. We have a little, almost one-year-old. His name's Azariah. He's our little miracle uh, boy. He was born last November. And so, um, and as Daniel shared, we have the privilege of leading this ministry called Firm Fellowship of Israel-related ministries, really helping a global family of believers around the world connect to local ministries and accelerate what's happening in congregations and ministries all across the country. Um, now, Daniel and Jaylene have a very special place in, in my heart because actually when I moved to Israel almost eight years ago, uh, the first place I landed, the first home I lived in was their home. Now, it wasn't a home like this. It didn't quite have this much space. It was a little apartment in Jerusalem, but they, they took me in that first month when I landed in their guest room, and that was before they had kids. That was before I was married, and so we just had a long uh, friendship and get to work closely with Daniel and Jaylene, and so you guys are really blessed to have them uh, here. I know they, they, they serve, and they, they love all of you dearly. So, as, as Pastor Daniel mentioned, you know, the question today is why should I care about Israel. And what does that mean for our faith? What does it mean for me today? I know we live here in this amazing country, and all of us maybe have different reasons for living here. You know, my wife and I, we made Aliyah. Some of us are serving and working here. Some of us were born here. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about my story and process this question. What does it mean for me to care about Israel? Why, why should I care? How is it relevant for me today? And I, I want to share a little bit of my story uh, I remember when I was, I, I'm not from here, as Daniel mentioned, I'm from Toronto, Canada, and I grew up, uh, and I, I thought God was calling me to go into the business world and to send money to the missions field, and so I had uh, a couple businesses uh, that I had started, and I remember the moment for me when I was in the middle of a fast and asking God, what, what are you calling me to? Uh, there was a passage of scripture that God led me to, and I read it. Um, for the first, it felt like the first time with new eyes, and that's Romans chapter 9. We're going to go through a lot of scripture today, uh, so I hope you like the Bible. Uh, but Romans chapter 9, I remember reading this, and let me just set the context for Romans chapter 9. You know, we, we get here after eight chapters of Romans, and Paul is giving us the fundamentals of our faith. You know, we, the first three chapters, we talk about sin and how the, the wages of sin is death. And in fact, in chapter four, we hear about Abraham, this man of faith. And, and in, five, we're, in ch chapter five, we hear about how we're justified by grace through faith. And chapter six and seven, we talk about how we struggle with sin. And then chapter eight is this beautiful chapter that talks about how all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. That we are more than conquerors that nothing can separate us from the love of Messiah. And so we're at this climax at the end of Romans chapter 8. And I want to I now read just the first five verses of Romans chapter 9. Paul says, I'm speaking the truth in the Messiah. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have a great sorrow and an unceasing anguish in my heart. I want to stop there. I remember reading this and thinking, wait, what is happening? You just said we're more than conquerors. You just said nothing can separate us from the love of Messiah. And now, and now you're saying that you have this great sorrow. You literally have this pain in your heart that's never ceasing. What, what are you feeling, Paul? And he goes on to say, I wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from the Messiah for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are the Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To, to them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Messiah, who is God over all. And I remember reading this and thinking, I do not share the emotions that Paul feels towards this people. 
And we could excuse it away and say, oh, well, this is just what Paul feels towards his people. I'm not, I'm not Jewish. I, I don't feel this way about the Jewish people. But we see this example in Paul, someone who's following after Yeshua, following after Messiah, and he's giving us his heart, this pain, this anguish. And I remember reading that and saying, God, there must, I, I don't feel that. Help me to feel what you feel. There must be something wrong in my heart, not wrong in your word. Help me to see what Paul sees. Help me to feel um, what he feels. And that's what we, I hope we can unpack a little bit today. Um, you know, as we talk about Israel, uh, all of us are kind of coming from a different uh, framework. I, I know I grew up and I kind of struggled. I kind of struggled with the idea of the election of Israel, the idea that God chose Israel. Some of that is how I grew up. I grew up in the church. But the idea that, that Israel was God's chosen people, that, that really, I, I wrestled with that. And I want to kind of normalize that. Like, for me, I grew up believing God treats everyone the same. And so, if God treats everyone the same, why would God choose one people over another people? That seems wrong. That seems like, that, that's not what we're supposed to do. I mean, we're taught growing up as little kids, hey, we should share, we should love everyone. And all of a sudden, we're seeing God choose one people over another. And what, what we, I realized was, God doesn't treat everyone the same. God loves everyone the same. They're, everyone has equal value in his sight. But the role and the purposes may be distinct as God chooses. You know, we read in Galatians, there is neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free nor male nor female. So, for you are all one in the Messiah, Yeshua. And Obviously, thank God if anyone's married uh, in here, you know, thank God that we still have male and female and that we still are different and distinct but equal in value in God's eyes. And I think as we unpack this um, issue, if we really ask God to work in our hearts, maybe if there is offense in our hearts like, like it was in my heart, God, why did you choose Israel? Um, the idea that God values everyone, God loves everyone, but God is also sovereign and he has the ability to choose and we have to wrestle with that. God, why did you make this choice? What was, what was the purpose of that? That's what we're going to try to unpack today. Why did you choose Israel? And why does that matter for me today? And we're going to talk a lot out of Romans 9 to 11. We're not going to get to everything. I encourage you to really uh, read over these chapters. I, uh, oftentimes in, in uh, the church around the world, it's easy for us to read all the way through Romans chapter 8. And then a lot of people skip right to Romans chapter 12. And kind of continue on. And if you know Romans chapter 12, it starts with, Therefore, in light of the mercies of God, let us present ourselves as living sacrifices. What we may not realize is what the therefore is there for. Therefore, in light of the mercies of God. He's talking about Romans 9 to 11. So it's very important we focus on that. But I, I just want to say this, and this is how I want to start us off. My favorite scripture in the entire Bible is the last verse of Romans 11, Romans 11, 33. After we unpack everything, after he talks about Israel and what the purpose is and what does that look like, Romans eleven thirty three. 33. I think this is a beautiful passage. At the end of all this, Paul kind of exalts, he worships, and he says, oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable are his ways. They can't be questioned. They can't be scrutinized. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are greater than our thoughts. And so, yes, God loves everyone. God wants every tongue, every tribe, every people, every nation to worship him, to come to an understanding and knowledge of Yeshua. But his ways are not our ways. And there's something beautiful in that. And so my prayer today is that we can see, just taste a little bit this morning of the wonder of how God chooses to work in this world. So with that, I'm going to pray and just that ask that God would open our hearts and that he would speak to us this morning, that we would not just be talking about Israel, but that we'd see past Israel to see the character and the nature of God. So Abba, I thank you for uh, this fellowship, this group of people that have come together this morning to worship you, to hear from your word, and I ask that you would open up our hearts, God. God, I ask that we would not bring our human conventions um, to, to limit, limit and inhibit us from understanding your ways. God, we give you all the glory, and we ask that you would give us a taste this morning through your word 
of what your purposes are for this people in this land today and how, what that means for our faith. God, what, what is our part uh, in this story? And I just ask that we would see you as you truly are, that we would magnify who you are, and we would enjoy you together this morning in Yeshua's name. Amen. So b- before we get started, I want to acknowledge one other thing. This is a mystery. This is a mystery. Paul says this is a mystery. He says in Romans eleven twenty five, lest you be wise in your own sight, I want you to be aw- I don't want you to be unaware of this mystery. And so when we're dealing with a mystery, we have to understand it's not something that we can always figure out on our own. It's something we need a a divine revelation as well. And so what we're hoping to approach this morning with are three things. One is a healthy theology. We need a healthy theology. We need to see what God's word says about this topic. And we're going to go through that this morning. The second thing we need is a heart-based revelation. It's not enough that we simply have the Word of God. We need, we need a divine, heart-based revelation to relate with what Paul was feeling, those emotions that he was feeling. And finally, we need an active response. And I'm going to give some suggestions uh, today of what our response can look like in light of this. So I want to start by talking about how Israel is special in the heart of God, and then I want to give three reasons why God chose Israel. So to start, Israel in the heart of God. You know, we read in the scripture verses like God, God talking about Israel and saying, you are the apple of my eye. Or in Jeremiah 31, he says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. We see in Exodus when God redeems Israel as a people out of Egypt. He brings them to Mount Sinai and he has this marriage covenant contract that, that, that is insinuated between them. He says, I will be your God and you will be my people. And even at a modern day Jewish wedding, we see this ketubah, this, this wedding covenant that's written that if you look at it, it kind of looks similar to the Ten Commandments. That's because that's what Sinai was. It was this marriage covenant covenant between God. God says, I've chosen you as a people. You will be my people. I will be your God. And later down in Jeremiah 31, it says, as far, as long as the sun continues to rise and set, if that goes away, then my love for Israel will go away. But so integrated into the elements of nature, into the elements of creation, God says, that's what my covenant looks like. And then we get to the New Testament. We get to the days of Yeshua. Yeshua is here in this land, and what I think is very interesting is, how do we know what's on Yeshua's heart? How do we know what, what really um, moves him? As he's fully God and fully man, he also shares emotions. And so when, how many times in the Bible did Jesus actually cry? How many times? Two? I think there's one more, three times. There's three times we actually see Jesus weep. Who knows, who knows when they were? Sorry, say it louder. Lazarus, Gethsemane, and over Jerusalem. Those are exactly the three. With Lazarus, when Lazarus died, Jesus came and he says he wept. In the garden of Gethsemane, right before the crucifixion, it says that he, he, he wept and he sweat blood. And then finally over Jerusalem. And I want to read that passage from Matthew 23 of when he weeps over Jerusalem. Matthew 23 is this passage where Jesus is talking to the religious leaders in Jerusalem. The religious leaders of Jerusalem. And and, uh, it's believed that he was on the Mount of Olives looking over Jerusalem. And he said these words. Matthew 23, verse 37 to 39. Oh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often... Would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? And yet you were not willing. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Or as we would say in modern Hebrew, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is a, this is a staggering passage. Jesus not only weeps, not only does he rebuke the religious leaders over Jerusalem, but he actually ties his return to their acceptance and acknowledgement of him as Messiah. 
And that's a pretty scary thing to do if you're not God, you know? You're saying, I'm, I'm not gonna, you're not going to see me again. I, I, I won't return here to this city until you say, Baruch Haba. In modern Hebrew, we know that this is welcome. Welcome you who come. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And this is why it's important to the heart of God that these special people is not just something from thousands of years ago. It's not just something with Moses or with King David, but even into the days of Yeshua and even to today, God says to the religious leaders of Jerusalem, you won't see me again. You won't see me return here on the Mount of Olives, return to Zion until the religious leaders acknowledge that I am coming from God. And I mean, imagine reading this passage thousands of years ago. Imagine reading this in, in AD 70, after the temple's destroyed, and all the Jewish religious leaders were kicked out of Jerusalem. What's that going to look like? How, how are they going to welcome him back if they're not even there? Ima- imagine reading this 500 years ago, 300 years ago, where there, there, there was no Israel. There, there weren't Jewish religious leaders that were living in Jerusalem. I mean, how do you interpret this? Maybe it's allegorical. Maybe it's a metaphor. Maybe Jesus just meant that they were going to understand in their heart, like it's something spiritual. But, but no, we stand here today in 2021, and there are Jewish religious leaders in Jerusalem. And I believe that, that Jesus means what he said. He will not return. The next time we see him physically descend on the Mount of Olives will be when the religious Jewish leaders in Jerusalem say, Baruch haba, welcome you who come in the name of the Lord. So we see this special, unique love in God's heart for Israel. And now my question is why? Why did God choose Israel to be his people in a special, unique way? Why? Help us make sense of this. And I'm going I'm to unpack three reasons why I believe God chose Israel. The first reason is, and I love that we sang this this morning, for his glory. For his glory. Um, I really wrestled with that growing up, to be honest. I remember when I was young in the faith, and we would sing songs, God, all of this is for your glory. And I would say, wait, I thought, I thought you work all things for, for my good. Like, what is it? Is it your glory or is it my good? Like, which one is it? Either you love me for, for me or you're, you're actually just some kind of narcissist and just really want everyone to have the glory for you. I don't, I don't know why. Like, do you want us all to serve you or do you really care about me? And I wrestled and wrestled and wrestled. And finally, I had this revelation from God that the greatest thing for our good is his glory. Him being high and lifted up is the best thing for us. God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. There is no contradiction between God's glory and our good. That's such an important uh, thing to see. I'm going to give you an example here and what that looks like for Israel. So Exodus 36, God chose Israel for his glory. What do I mean by that? Let's go to Exodus 36 together. Sorry, I said Exodus, I mean Ezekiel. Please forgive me. Ezekiel 36. And we're going to start down at verse 22. Ezekiel 36, 22. Now listen carefully. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, this is God speaking through the prophet Ezekiel, thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act. That's a great way to start a message from the Lord. It's not for your sake that I'm about to act, but it's for the sake of my holy name, which you've profaned among the nations to which you came. So he's saying, when when you, Israel, were dispersed, when you went among the nations of the earth, there was a level of profanity of God's name. God's name was uh, uh, marred in some ways because God said, this is your land. I'm giving it to you as an eternal inheritance. And he says, by you leaving the land, you actually profaned my name. And he says, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations and which you profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord. When, I, when through you, I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. So it's such an interesting passage. I think, you know, it's easy to talk about God's love of Israel and 
uh, oh, you're the apple of my eye, and I've loved you with an everlasting love. But then we see this passage, and it feels kind of harsh. I mean, imagine, imagine looking at your spouse and saying, you know, it's not for your sake that I'm going to do this. I'm doing this for the sake. I, I mean, it, it, it sounds so offensive if it wasn't God saying it. But God's point is, Israel, it's not about you. It's not about you. Even when God chose Abraham, what did he say? I, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And through your seed, I'm going to bless all the nations of the earth. He's saying, Abraham, I chose you to be a conduit of blessing to all the nations of the earth. So don't, don't just get so wrapped up and think it's only about you and your family because you're so special. In fact, Deuteronomy says it's not because you're the most special or you're the most holy or that you're the largest or most talented of the nations. Actually, it's because you're the weakest and because you struggle that I want to use you. So this is what God says to Israel. It's not about you. It's about the holiness of my name being vindicated. It's about the nations of the world knowing that I am the Lord. And what is the plan? What what does he mean by that? In verse 24, he goes on to say, I will take you from the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. What I want us to see from this, well, first of all, we often quote this uh, in churches around the world. Oh God, remove the heart of stone. Give us a heart of flesh. I think it's important to recognize in its original context, this was spoken to the people of Israel. And not only that, let's, let's be careful to notice the order of events, the sequence of events. I think it's intentional. First, God says, Israel, I'm about to act. You don't deserve it. It's not because you deserve it. It's not because you earned it. It's for the sake of my holy name. Second, he says, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take you from all the nations around the world, and I'm going to gather you back into your own land. We've seen that happen in the last 73 years here in this country. We've seen millions of people come over land, air, and sea back to this land by divine, nothing short of divine intervention, coming back to the land of their fathers. So first he says, you don't deserve it. I'm not doing it for your sake. Then he says, I'm going to bring you back to the land. And then he says, once you're back in the land, I will sprinkle clean water on you. And you shall be clean, and I'll cleanse you from your idols, and I'll give you a new heart, and I'll put my spirit within you, and then you will be my people, and I will be your God. So there's this physical restoration that happens, followed by a spiritual restoration. We don't have time to get into it, but the very next chapter, Ezekiel 37, talks about this vision of the Valley of Dry Bones. And it paints the same picture, that there's a physical restoration, bones coming together, flesh upon flesh, Bones being assembled, and then there's a spiritual restoration. The, the wind, the ruach, the life from around the four corners of the world breathes and, and causes this people to live again. And, and if, you, if we had time to unpack that, Ezekiel 37, it says this is the whole house of Israel. It, it, it actually, this isn't, this isn't just Michael's interpretation. This is God interpreting his word, his vision to the prophet Ezekiel. So why did God choose Israel? Well, first of all, for his glory. That, that he would be seen as a covenant-keeping God. That the nations would know God's character. They would know his character. That they would know that even when Israel's faithless, God remains faithful. This should be a guarantee for us today. You know, there, there are people that come to me and say, Michael, you know, I, I just don't think, I mean, I don't think Israel still matters in God's eyes. And, and I say to them, well, I, I'd be very scared then as a new covenant believer because what guarantee do I have that I won't do something too bad one day. I won't screw up enough that, that God just says, you know what? Actually, I'm done with you. I'm going I'm to move on to plan C. The guarantee we have is in the character of God, and it's because of his relationship with Israel. We see his example. We see that he is God. We see that the Jewish people return to this land, not because they deserve it, not for their sake, but for the sake of his holy name. So number one, for his glory. Number two, why did God choose Israel to be his people? 
for our example, for his glory and for our example. And, and I can unpack this. We don't have a ton of time, but 1 Corinthians 10, it's an amazing passage. Uh, it's really hard to understand because basically they're quoting from all these Old Testament stories. But Paul's quoting from all these Old Testament stories, and then he says this line, 1 Corinthians 10. He says, now all of these things, talking about Israel, all these things took place as an example for us, that we may not desire evil as they did. And we see this, this beautiful thing that God says, I've given you Israel as this example. When you see Israel prone to wander, hard-headed, we should be looking like we're looking in a mirror. We should see ourselves. We should learn from their example. I want to break this down for you in maybe a way that we can all understand. Uh, how many of you have some kind of sibling? Have an older or younger sibling? Okay. I'm the, I'm the eldest sibling. I have one younger sister. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, I think what's interesting with this is my perspective, and maybe you would agree or disagree, depending on who you are, is that the oldest sibling, the eldest sibling usually has, gets a tougher time from the parents. I mean, the, how many know, like, the youngest sibling kind of gets a, a little easy? My wife is the youngest sibling, so I kind of make fun of her. Uh, she always got it easy. And when me and my sister were growing up, it always seemed that I got it the hardest from our parents. We'd, we'd get into trouble, and our parents wouldn't say, Michael and Olivia. They, what would they say? They'd say, Michael. They said, you should have known better. And a lot of times, they would pretty much just ignore her. Um, and I, I felt like she took advantage of that and exploited me in a lot of ways as a, as a younger uh, uh, sibling. But there's certain things that my sister learned never to do by watching my interaction with our parents. And they would be more severe with me, but a lot of times they would expect her to watch and learn from my example. And so it is with Israel. In God's family of the nations, every language, every people is loved and valued by God. But there's only one firstborn nation. That's the nation and the people of Israel. And so, yes, God is working for his glory there's something about his character. There's something we see about his relationship with Israel. But second, it's for our example that we can, we can learn. We can see. We can see his character. We can see his justice, his, 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 the way he disciplines and learn from their example. And the third piece of this is for the redemption of the world. It's for his glory. It's for our example. And it's for the redemption of the world. And this is where we get into the mystery a little bit here. Why would God choose to do things this way? I mean, if I was, if I was God, I and mean, that's a dangerous thought, but if I was God, I mean, send, send your son, send the Messiah, and just slowly take over the world. I mean, why, why does he have to be resurrected? Why do we have to send the Spirit? Why, why choose the church? I mean, there's, there's so many things I would do differently. Uh, and, and, and there's this question even in Romans 9 through 11. God, what, if you've said that Israel's going to be your people and you'll be their God, then what on earth happened? Did they catch you off guard? I mean, why when you sent your son, and literally Jesus' words, to the lo I'm sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's his purpose. Why would you send your son to the lost sheep of the house of Israel? And most of them reject him. Were you not powerful enough to bring about the change you wanted? Did that, did that catch you off guard? And, and Paul answers this in Romans chapter 11. We're going we're gonna to dive through a couple verses here, but Romans 11, verses 11. Paul asked this question. So I ask, did they, he's talking about the Jewish people, did they stumble in order that they might fall? That, that they might fall away completely? Like, did they stumble and now God says, no, you know what, plan B, I'm going to the Gentiles. Paul says, by no means. Rather, now listen to this, through their trespass, Salvation has come to the nations so as to make Israel jealous. I, I mean, that is such a statement. There's three parts to that. Through their trespass, through their disobedience, because of their stumbling, because they rejected him, so, and I would, I would argue from my perspective, that wasn't the plan. But God's saying, because of their rejection, Salvation has come to the Gentiles. Because 
they're, because they stumbled and fell, now salvation's been opened up to every tribe, every tongue, every nation. I, we go travel to the four corners of the earth. You have people in China. You have people in uh, Singapore, in Peru, in South Africa, all over the world that are worshiping the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because of their trespass, salvation's actually come to the rest of the world. And, and that might be good enough, right? That could have been good enough. It's like the greater good theory. Well, we're going to let these ones stumble because it's going to be better for the whole world. But God doesn't stop there. He says, through their trespass, salvation's come to the nations so as to make Israel jealous. And he goes on, let's jump down to verse 12. For if there, again talking about Israel, if, if the Jewish people's rejection meant the reconciliation of the world to God, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Sorry, that's verse 15. I'm sorry, I skipped ahead here. If their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, if, if their trespass meant the gospel now has traveled to the ends and the corners of the world, what will it mean when, they're, when, when they accept him? What will that look like but life from the dead? Many theologians have studied this verse, life from the dead. And everyone, uh, probably the most common view of what this means is actually this worldwide revival. That there's something that when, if, let me say it this way. If Israel, if, if, if Israel is a player on a sports team, if Israel is one of our star players, and Israel's sitting on the bench, Israel is kind of out of the game right now. And while Israel's out of the game, we're seeing salvation go to the nations. What's going to happen when Israel resumes her calling, resumes her identity to be a light to the nation? We're going to see this worldwide revival life from the dead. And, um, and this is a challenge for us. It's a challenge for us to live here. I mean, we see these biblical truths. Some of them, we can maybe taste today how we're further along than we would have been a couple hundred years ago. Some of them we may not. You know, Paul, at the end of Romans 11, Paul goes into verse 28. He says, in regards to the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. And, and some of us, we feel that today. You know, uh, they're enemies of the gospel. But as regards to election and calling, they, the Jewish people, are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. So while they may feel like enemies, they're actually beloved and treasured by God. Why? For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. And I know in church, growing up in church, this was quoted all the time. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. They won't change. But this was spoken about Israel. The gifts and calling of God to Israel are irrevocable. Doesn't matter if they're faithless. Doesn't matter if they, they, they stumble. It says, for just as at one time you were disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of Israel's disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they may receive mercy. I know it's a, it's a complicated statement, but it's saying if, 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 when we, if, if when you were disobedient, because of Israel's disobedience, you've inherited mercy. Now, by the mercy you've received, God wants us to show that mercy to Israel. And, and we might ask the big why question. God, this is so complicated. Why, why, why do this this way? And I believe this is answered in this last verse, in verse 32. For God has shut up all mankind under disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. I believe on that last day, when we're standing before the judgment seat, and we're looking and giving an account of our lives, a Jewish person won't be able to say, well, I was Jewish. Well, you know, there, there was a stumbling. Or, and you can't say, oh, well, I'm a, I was a Gentile, because you were disobedience, and you, you were grafted in to this miracle. It's so that no man would boast, but that God would have mercy on all. And so in closing, these are the three, three reasons I believe. Why did God choose Israel as a special people? One, for his glory. Two, for our example. And three, for the redemption of the world. God's mysterious plan of redemption of all Jews and all Gentiles, all the people of the world. So what should our response be? What, what does this mean for us? And I'm going to just suggest very quickly three responses. The first is gratitude, a response of gratitude. You know, Romans 11, earlier in the verse, in, in verse 17, it says, do not be arrogant. And the example it uses, it says, 
Remember, you're not the one that supports the root. The root supports you. If you are not Jewish and you've come to believe in the new covenant, you've come to believe in the promises, the, the, you, you have the word of God, you treasure it. That, that wasn't something that was originally promised to you. It was promised to the people of Israel. So don't be arrogant. It says, remember, the root supports you. You don't support the root. There's a spirit of gratitude that we can feel as we, as we see God, who you are, that you gave us this older brother as an example for us, that we could see your glory. There should be this spirit of gratitude. Even that they, the Jewish people have preserved the word of God through generations and centuries and millennia to, to get to us today. The second response is one of sorrow. And while I think we need to feel gratitude, I think we also need to feel what Paul felt, that unceasing anguish, that great sorrow. And that's not something I can impart or you can impart. It's just something we have to um, long for, pray for that heart. Pray that we would have that same love, that same godly sorrow that would say, God, God I, I want your people to see you as you are. That the Messiah, he's, he's the Messiah of all people, but he was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And finally, we should respond with gratitude, respond with sorrow, and then finally, respond with action. We're in, we're in a very interesting position, all of us. We live here in Israel. And God says that salvation's gone to the nations so as to make Israel envious, to make Israel jealous. What does that look like in our context? What does that look like for our neighbors or our coworkers or the people that we're around? Does our faith provoke to jealousy? Does our faith, does, our, do the, do, does the new covenant that we live out, just remember that's, that it wasn't promised to Christians. It was promised to the Jewish people. We've been grafted into it. The nations of the world have been grafted into this promise, but we can go and, and, and provoke them to jealousy. You know, as I hear about some of the things you guys are doing as a community, as a congregation, it, it reminds me of Romans 15. Paul makes this argument uh, in verse 26 of Romans 15. He says, For if the Gentiles have come to share with the Jewish people in spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material things. Well, there's this argument that he's saying, well, if we've received so much spiritually, how can we be a physical blessing? How can we provoke to jealousy? How can we be a physical blessing? How can we live our faith here in this land in a way that provokes the Jewish people to jealousy? And maybe there's opportunities to connect, to serve, to bless other ministries around Israel that are reaching people. Uh, that's something with Firm that we'd love to help connect and serve you in that. But you guys are doing an amazing thing here in this city where there's a lot of people that don't know the truth of Yeshua, the truth of him as Messiah. And there's an opportunity for us to walk in a way where we provoke to jealousy. So that would just be my three points. Why did God choose Israel? For his glory, for an example for us, and for the redemption of the world. And how should we respond? With gratitude, with sorrow in our heart, asking God for that sorrow, and finally with action to live a life that provokes to jealousy. So with that, let me pray over us all. Abba, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth. I thank you that we are not God, but you are God. You stand alone as God, that you are sovereign, that you are good, that you are loving. And God, we thank you for your faithfulness. God, we thank you that your faithfulness has not run dry on Israel. We thank you that while many in this land today do not see you, Yeshua, as their Messiah, that you continue to love them with an everlasting love. God, I ask that you would use the men and women in this room to live lives that provoke our neighbors, our friends, our co-workers to jealousy. That they would see something special in our life. That they would see the power of the Holy Spirit at work that they would see the, the, the redemptive new covenant life at work, that they would see a love for your word at work, and that it would be unlike what they could access from the rabbis, unlike what they've experienced in a synagogue, but that it would provoke to jealousy. God, I ask for those who are here today that, that you would just give us your heart. God, maybe people are hearing this and this might be the first time we're reading some of these things, the first time that it's resonating this way. God, I ask that you would give us a spirit of gratitude 
towards your people here. It's hard sometimes when we're having frustrating customer service calls on the phone to to really feel gratitude towards uh, the people in this land. But God, we ask for your heart of gratitude. We ask that you would give us the emotions that Paul had, the emotions that Yeshua had that would weep over Jerusalem, that would pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And God, we ask that we would see the day where all of Israel will be saved. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Michael. And really appreciate that. I'll take the other mic. Thank you so much, Michael. Really appreciate you, your, the word uh, that we also believe God put on your heart. Uh, so thank you for faithfully walking in his ways. And thank you for all that you Vanessa, you guys do as a couple, as a family, as a ministry. And uh, maybe a small connection with that, because we are maybe closer connected than some of you think. Uh, It's actually the same founder, Wayne Hilston, uh, who is the founder of King of Kings uh, Community Jerusalem, King of Kings Ministries, and Firm. So we get to share that a little bit. And actually, I think this is what brings us a little bit closer together than, than some others, just almost like a connection as family. So, thank you so much. And we, it's kind of, I don't want to call it tradition, but at the end of the service, uh, we, we just submit ourselves under the blessing of the Lord. And it's a great reminder for actually what Michael spoke, because that blessing actually was first meant uh, for our older brother, Israel. And here in number 6, 22, it actually says, and to the Lord... Spoke, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. So, this is just a great reminder who is first, who is our, our older brother. As you read it, as you pray that, just maybe slide in God. We we'll, we also pray for, for the people of Israel. And we, we get to be and, and to have that privilege here of being Jews and Gentiles uh, together, coming uh, united in front of God's throne through Yeshua the Messiah. So just keep that in mind as we pray that, as we bless each other. We have an older brother who got this blessing first. Uh, We have the wonderful privilege of being crafted in and doing things together. But I, I like your your example of older, I'm the older brother too, uh, or the older sibling, so I can, I uh, can see how that works. Uh, so, and I do actually the same to my kids uh, too. I pass that on. Anyway, uh, let's pray. If you like, you can stand, and let's just go under that blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face to you and give you his shalom, his peace. Amen. Have a wonderful Shabbat. Enjoy. See you next week uh, for the potluck and for the service, of course. And hey, uh, try that coffee. But always remember, it's harder than it's been before. Uh, So enjoy.